So I titled my talk today, um, Challenging Projects in Making the Impossible Happen. Um, DARPA is an amazing organization and that our mission is really to change people's minds as to what is possible and what's not. Um, one of the most exciting things that we're known for is the ARPANET, and it really started as just an idea. J.C. Licklider, who became an uh, office director at DARPA as well, uh, when first telling his colleagues about this, talked about this grand intergalactic network um, in the early uh, 60s. And he imagined this great electronic medium where everyone could share information, but it was just an idea. And it started with just this simple network that he built at a few universities connecting up a few mainframe computers together. And then it grew into a, um, a cross-country type of network, and then eventually it became the internet, um, which we all know today and isn't just a technology, it is, it's the economy by this point. Um, beyond that, DARPA has been famous for launching a diversity of different types of technologies. The IT revolution and Silicon Valley as we know it today grew out of um, investments in DARPA. Uh, GPS, which we all use on our phones today to get anywhere. I used it to get, to get here today from my house in Arlington. Um, and most recently, the neural interface and prosthetics work that DARPA has started to invest in. Um, we really span a huge array of different technologies, but each of these starts with a core idea, which is um, is there a breakthrough new idea and technological capability that we can build that no one thinks is possible or, or even able to do today? And so when Annette asked me to, to speak at this conference um, today and told me about the mission of NBCC to find a cure for breast cancer, um, I thought, this is just perfect. Because you're trying to do something that a lot of people may not think is possible in the near term. Um, but that's, that's our sweet spot. We live in it every day. and um, we know how to go about addressing those kind of challenges and actually proving to people what can be done. So DARPA has been, of course, um, we've, we've developed numerous types of breakthrough capabilities, um, but there's a slight paradox. Uh, if you look at how much the U.S. spends in uh, R&D over the entire economy, both private and public, it's about $400 billion. The interesting thing is that DARPA is less than 1% of that. We're about a $2.9 billion agency annually. Um, other research institutes, the NIH, $30 billion, Department of Energy, $10 billion. And so you might ask yourself, you know, less than 1% of the total U.S. investment in R&D, and yet we've had this amazing impact. So, so how do you do that with such a limited budget? Um, and so to answer this question, you really have to know about our history, why we were formed, and how we do what we do. And as it was just alluded to before me, um, it really started all in 1957 when the Soviets launched this polished metal sphere 23 inches in diameter that passed over the United States every 96 minutes. And it was the launch of Sputnik. Um, and it kicked off the space age, uh, a space race, and you know, really sent the US into a total shock. We were in the post-World War II era, and we had assumed that we were uh, technologically superior to everyone else in the world. Um, but with the launch of Sputnik, all that was called into question. And the leadership at the time decided that this was a clear failing of the current R&D infrastructure in the United States at the time. There was NSF and there were the military labs, but um, they hadn't been able to beat the Russians. And so it was uh, by executive order that Eisenhower actually established DARPA. It wasn't an act of Congress. Um, Eisenhower decided that the only way that we would be able to maintain our technological lead was to start an entirely new type of organization devoted to preventing and creating technological strategic surprise. It's the mission of DARPA for the last 56 years to create and anticipate and demonstrate breakthrough technological capabilities for the United States. That's our mandate, that's all we do. We're not supposed to do anything incremental, we're supposed to prove what's possible. And we've been able to do it through a dedication to three strategic points. The first one is a dedication to only working on projects that have breakthrough national security capabilities or that will lead to a differentiated and superior US technology base. Those are the only technologies that we work on. And then a third component, is making sure that we have a vibrant DARPA community. And what I mean by that is vibrant people at DARPA leading the programs and a vibrant set of researchers working on the programs that we care about. 
So I'll start with the first point, which is our dedication to breakthrough national security capabilities. And all I'll say about this is the key point about this is focus. If you have a limited budget and a mandate as big as breakthrough national security capabilities, that's all you can afford to focus on. And that defines each one of our programs that we have running at DARPA. There's a million different great ideas out there and research ideas, but we can't fund them all, no matter how interesting or groundbreaking they might be. It's only the things that are gonna to lead to a capability that we care about. So we turn down a lot of great researchers simply because they're not trying to do, they're not on the same path and vision as we are. The second major point is a differentiated US technology base. So our main goal is figuring out how do we go and go above and beyond the technology that you can find elsewhere in the world? How do we make the US have a technology base that is superior to everywhere else? And this is much harder to do. When you're just looking out across the sea, you actually have to figure out what technologies look like they might be on an exponential path. So the area that I'll talk about and that I'm most familiar with and that I think all of you will be interested in is engineering biology. It's an emerging field uh, that is just being made possible today. And the interesting part about it is that it's really how do you forward design the genetic code to manipulate different types of cells. And this could be anything from a mammalian cell to a bacteria to a yeast to a plant. And really what this is about is understanding how you can get the kind of function you want in your host by programming up the DNA. It's very similar to a computer. You're just writing the code and getting it to execute. Why this is made possible is for three different types of trends. Uh, the first one has been the radically rapid decrease in the cost of DNA sequencing. So if you look in 1995, we sequenced the first bacterial genome. And in 2003, we were able to sequence the first human genome. But it took us $3 billion in 10 years. Just recently, it was announced that we're at the $1,000 genome mark, and it takes you less than a week to have that DNA sequenced. Um, I can't think of any other technology that has advanced this quickly. It's faster than Moore's Law, for those of you who are familiar with it. And I, we have so much data, we now don't even know what to do with it. Um, it's created this different type of challenge that we have to get our arms around. The second major challenge that we've started to overcome is the ability to take all this information that we've been sequencing and then actually be able to synthesize that information. So now we've been able to go from very small snippets of DNA that we can synthesize to whole genomes, which was announced a few years ago. So not only can we sequence genomes, we can actually start to build them up and manipulate them and study the effects of genetic changes. The third major change, which I think is actually the thing that is most exciting for all of us, is the rapid growth in the number of people flooding into this field, this idea of forward engineering of biology. Um, what we see is exemplified here by this, this, um, the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, which is a, a college competition for um, young kids who want to go and learn how to do these kind of interesting experiments is that what we see is a flood of people from engineering, from physics, mathematics, all flooding into biology. And that's a great thing for us. When you see people from other fields flooding into a, um, a field such as biology, what it lets you know is that means it's ripe for innovation. So all of these components together, decrease in the cost of sequencing, uh, um, a decrease in the cost of synthesis and the ability to synthesize very large constructs, as well as a 30x growth in new entrants into the field, um, necessarily means that there's going to be a disruptive uh, technology base and capabilities that are going to be coming out in the biological sciences. So when I came to DARPA and I saw the trends heading in this direction, I pitched a program to them called Living Foundries, which I'm going to tell you about now. And really the heart of Living Foundries is a, typical, is a totally different view of biology. And it's biology is technology. Many people, I think, in the room, when you think about biology, your, your mind immediately goes to biomedical research. But because of all these trends that I just showed you, which are really technological advances, what it allows us to do is build off of that base of biomedical research and actually start to think about building up capabilities. So not science for science's sake, but biology for technology for a new type of capability. Um, what we want people to think of is that when you think of solving a technological problem, you might think of using physics or mathematics or electrical engineering or computer science. We want people to think about applying biology to that problem as well. 
So if you look at the state of biological engineering today, uh, the state of the art is simply that we take sugar, we feed it to cells that already do things that we're interested in and hope that they keep doing it. So maybe we'll get out some sort of chemical or a biofuel or a new type of um, biologic or pharmaceutical. Um, unfortunately, we are very poor at doing this. We can only do a very small subset of the chemicals we might be interested in, the fuels we might be interested in, or even the pharmaceuticals. Um, what I'd like to do is open up this aperture completely. What I'd like to be able to do is program that DNA instruction set and tell that cell what chemicals or fuels or pharmaceuticals I'm interested in. But then I want to go beyond that. Um, I think most of us in this room would agree that biology is probably one of the most powerful technologies that we know of. Um, it can self-heal. It's programmable. It can adapt. It can evolve. It can scale from one cell to billions. There is no other technology that I can think about that has that suite of capabilities. And so what I'd like to start thinking about is going after things like complex materials. If you think about the skin on us or any of our organs, those are materials. They're just incredibly interesting and functional, and we'd like to be able to harness those using biology. I'd also like to um, be able to change the range of inputs that I could put into a cell, not just sugar, but let's say cellulose, natural gas, CO2, coal, sunlight, any of the natural resources that we might have. And so we can really start thinking about biology as a technology that can allow us to create new types of materials, new types of therapeutics. Can we think about sentinel organisms that can roam around and sense things for us? And even about a new type of manufacturing paradigm. That's the vision of Living Foundries. Unfortunately, we, lack, we still lack a lot of the tools to be able to harness any of these. So on the plot that I've projected up, what you see are several different blue dots, and all of these are different bioproducts that have come out in the recent years. And on the y-axis, I've plotted the amount of effort it took to engineer an organism to spit out these different bioproducts. And on the x-axis, I have the amount of complexity it took to engineer um, those bioproducts. And um, I've roughly done it as number of genes you might have inserted or modified in the organism. Um, unfortunately, today, we're still well below modifying more than 10 genes in an organism to get it to do what we need to do. Um, and at the same time, even modifying just a couple of genes gives this huge increase in cost and time to create any sort of product. So for example, Amaris has created an artemisinin drug. Um, it cures malaria. Unfortunately, um, it took them nearly a decade and tens to almost $100 million of investment. Um, that's a life-saving cure, and we can't afford to do that every single time we want to harness biology to make another one of these um, great materials, great therapeutics. And so what I sold to DARPA was, was that I want to change this paradigm. I want to be able to forward engineer. That it means manipulate as many genes as I need to in my cell, and I wanted to do it at a very low cost. And so that's the goal of Living Foundries. So it's, I've started a program several years ago on the upper left-hand quadrant, Levering Foundries ATCG. And this is one of the hallmarks of DARPA, which is where I've quantitatively told you where I want to go. A lot of research programs will say, uh, build, us a way, build us a cure, make things cheaper. Well, how much cheaper? Make things faster. Well, how much faster? A hallmark of DARPA is that we tell you, I want a 100x faster design build test cycle for engineering biology. Show me how I can get there. Luckily, that program has been incredibly successful for a variety of reasons. One, that I've involved people from the engineering community into my program. It's not a biology program, as I tell many people. Uh, it has physicists, it has engineers, it has computer scientists, it has mathematicians all working on the project. And we've been able to drop the, co drop the time and cost to be able to engineer biological systems by at least 70x so far. Building on that, we've now putting in place a new type of um, infrastructure, a foundry infrastructure, to scale up the results that we've gotten in the first few years of this project. And um, in tr true DARPA style, what we've decided to call it is the DARPA 1000 Molecules Program, and it's to enable impossible projects. I want to be able to create a whole new materials paradigm for the United States. I want to enable a whole new paradigm of how we even think about manipulating biological systems. Um, as a proof point for that, my goal is to make 1,000 new chemical building blocks. Why that's exciting is that if you think about all the synthetic materials that you have around you today, they're all derived from a barrel of oil. And the molecules that you get out of a barrel of oil are actually pretty simplistic. And what that means is when you put those simple molecules together, you're pretty limited in the kind of chemistries that you can do and the type of materials properties that you get out. 
However, if you can harness the type of chemical building blocks that a cell can make, those are complex, they're highly functional, they have properties that we don't know how to emulate using chemistry. And if we can use those as building blocks to build up new types of materials, we can actually start to think about a whole new revolution in materials. So essentially what I want to do is go from a paradigm where we rely on petroleum and natural gas and we can open up a whole new realm where we can think about genetically encoded materials. So actually designing materials at the genetic level and then having biology create those for us. I want to close um, talking about what really makes DARPA DARPA, which is the vibrant DARPA community. That is the program managers at DARPA, the people who run the programs, as well as the research community. Um, without, any of, without any of those two components, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we've been able to do. So I'm going to go in, in opposite order of what I have here and first talk about programs. Uh, as I said earlier, all of our programs focus on research and development for building capabilities, not research and development for science sake. This makes us very different from somebody like NSF or even NIH. Um, it also means that not everybody is meant to be a researcher for DARPA. We often have to turn people down who want to do science for science sake. The second thing is that we engage anybody and everybody. Um, DARPA doesn't just work with traditional academic researchers. We often work with companies, with nonprofits, with um, you know one or two person companies working out of their apartment. We'll take anybody with a great idea and a way to get there. We're incredibly multidisciplinary. Um, I actually think this is one of the great secrets to DARPA's, DARPA's success is that we don't look for the typical players in a field. We look for people at the fringes who have different ideas, for people who are going to challenge the status quo. Um, who are very smart and have a new approach. Um, we are incredibly risk tolerant. Um, if your mission is to change what people think is possible, you have to be able to tolerate risk. We do everything we can do to buy down that technical risk. We set out very clear milestones, but we're willing to take it on. We're not afraid of risk. It's okay to fail as long as you know how to get back up and reorient yourself and head towards the same mission. That's what we care about. Um, like I said, we are very milestone and goal driven. We set out hard metrics for people. When I have um, a university performer or somebody from um, industry and we agree on a plan together, we agree on milestones. And they might say, oh, but science isn't predictable. And I say, that's fine, but we can all predict where we should be in a year. And if we're not there, we have to decide, should we stop or should we keep going? Um, that's an incredibly powerful thing to have whenever you're funding research because it allows you to reorient very quickly and as it says at the last bullet, you can start and end programs quickly. I think this is the real power of DARPA. If you look around many other funding agencies, it's, you find these entrenched groups where funding on certain projects just goes on and on and on and it's just 10 years out or it's five years out or give us another um, you know, 10 years and we'll finally be there. Um, what DARPA does is it says if it's 10 years out and we don't think there's a new approach that's going to bring that timeline down, maybe we'll just get out of this area for a while and come back if it looks ripe again. Um, that's a very unique thing about DARPA and a very powerful thing. I also want to talk a little bit about how we even go after different types of research programs. Um, the interesting thing about DARPA is it's bottoms up. We recruit program managers, I was, I was recruited to DARPA, and then we ask them, if you had $50 million or $70 million, what would you do with that money? Where would you, where would you invest it? What great capability would you build? Um, DARPA is very unique in that it's, we recruit people with great ideas. We don't tell them the great ideas. Um, this helps get away from groupthink. Um, you hire people with a passion. So it's their job to come up with the need and capability. They need to pitch it to the DARPA leadership. They need to say, here's the brand new capability I'm going to build for you. Here's why I think it's even feasible scientifically and technically. Here's how much money I think it's going to cost and here's how long I think it's going to take. And if the DARPA leadership then agrees with you and says this is interesting enough, we're willing to take it on, um, you get your money, you put out a broad agency announcement to the research community and say here's my grand vision, I'm not going to prescribe how to get there, you're going to tell me how I can get there. And then the projects start and it's the most fun you'll ever have in your life. Um, it's tremendous going to work with people who are totally aligned with your vision, who get up every morning and they're driving to the same place you are in terms of end goal and milestones. And they call you every few weeks and tell you about something awesome that's going on or something that they don't think is going to work but they have a plan for a way around it. Um, I have to say it was, 
it's so much fun to work with tremendously smart people who are worried about the same things you are and who want to accomplish the same goals that you do. So lastly, I'll talk about the program managers at DARPA and what makes them special. Um, a lot of these I think you'll, you'll understand. Technically excellent, listens and learns, they can build a vision, et cetera. But the really important things are that you kind of want people who are barely manageable. Um, <laughs> you want some, yeah, I say this now that I'm in a leadership position with a little, a little anxiety, because I was definitely barely manageable. Um, you need people who are bold, who are gonna be comfortable challenging the status quo. Um, who don't mind doing some bad behavior, as in they know what rules can be bent. Um, somebody who always follows the rules isn't always who you want. Um, they're always going to fight because they believe in their program so much that they'll, can, they'll stay and fight with you for hours about why it needs to be done. And the most important thing is that they're transient. When you come to DARPA, you don't come for 10 years or 20 years. You come for maybe three to five years. The idea is come from somewhere great, come into DARPA, you have three or five years to make your mark, and then you leave. Um, so often you don't get to see the fruits of your programs. You have to convince somebody else that it's worth continuing. Um, but I think that's another powerful aspect of DARPA. And finally, and I'll close with this, which is the, the Heimeyer Catechism. So these are the questions we ask everyone, um, both the program managers as well as the performers who come to work at DARPA. And it's a little flip from how traditional scientific grant writing goes. Usually scientific grant writing is, well, tell us about the science. And that's not what DARPA says. It says, number one, what are you trying to do? Why is it so important? And then number two, um, well, how is it done today? And why is what you're proposing so radically new? And then number three, um, why do you think it will be successful? So these questions really help people to go down the list and actually think about why their work is going to have impact and why we should care about it. And then once we're bought into that, we say, OK, tell me why it's technically feasible. So that's DARPA. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you this afternoon. And uh, I think it's going to be a wonderful conference. <laughs>